Welcome to the podcast for Westside A Jesus Church. We hope this teaching encourages and empowers you to love, learn, and live the way of Jesus. We're going to kind of tackle chapter 9 in three big chunks. Uh, the first chunk is kind of verse 1 through 7, and it's the healing account. And we're going to dive a little bit into that. Now, the second chunk is in verses 8 through 34, and it's this series of four interrogations that take place uh, with this blind man. And then from verses, the third chunk, verses three, or 35 through 41, is, this where, is where Jesus introduces himself to this blind man, and he does this little teaching. So as we're reading and as we're kind of working through this, I want to encourage you to be listening for those words and those images and those metaphors that John has been laying out throughout the entire first eight chapters, okay? John loves to play with words. He just does. And, and, and he loves double meanings, and he, and he likes to like pull us into the Old Testament by using images and metaphors. And so if you see one that kind of leaps out to you and we don't have a chance to talk about it, I want to encourage you, circle it. If you're a circler in your Bible, like circle it and go back to it later because there's so much meat inside some of these pictures and metaphors and images that John lays out. Now, if you're holding an iPad, don't circle it on your iPad unless you have one of the fancy pants pens because I don't want to be blamed for the damage that you do to your iPad, so... That was supposed to be a joke, okay? <laughs> Here we go, healing account. As he went along, he said, he saw a man, a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming, when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Now, <clears throat> As a reader, we kind of recognize the story, don't we? It's very similar to the circumstance and story that we read in chapter 5. Uh, there's, there's a pool, there's a healing, there's some awkward circumstances. Uh, it happens on the Sabbath. The religious leaders get involved. And, and all of this is really similar, but the difference is the response of the man who gets healed. Whereas in chapter five, we kind of have this guy that kind of becomes a bit of a tattletale. Here we have a situation where this man obeys and ends up becoming a witness. As, mentioned, as Weston mentioned last week, this is a classic story from John, a miraculous healing or claim, which is about to be followed by some controversy. Remember, Jesus is still at the Feast of Tabernacles with its water and its light ceremonies. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, I'd encourage you to like back up a few weeks, go look at the podcast. Dom talked about what's going on in this ceremony, but there's all this imagery around water and light. And, and, and Jesus is stepping into this in chapter nine. He's literally living out the message of chapter eight. And here it is. Jesus is the true light that surpasses everything the temple has to offer. And he is the messenger from God who is bringing God's word and life to all who believe. Let me read that again. This is what he's summarizing in chapter nine. Jesus is the true light that surpasses everything the temple has to offer. And he's a messenger from God who is bringing God's word and life to all who believe. So, in chapter 9, we meet a man who has spent his whole life living in darkness. And he's suddenly given light. This man's physical healing becomes a living symbol of spiritual renewal. Remember, John loves to play with imagery, right? And so the irony in this is that at the end of this story, everything is going to be reversed. The, one, the man who once lived in darkness will now be filled with light inside and out. And those who have quote unquote perfect sight will find themselves in utter darkness. The disciples open our story with this very uncomfortable question for our Western ears. Who sinned? 
who sinned, Jesus, in this situation? Now, to be sure, this was a very common belief in this time, in this era. There was kind of like this cause and effect belief in how things worked. If you lived a sinful life, it, could, it was going to lead to sickness. And if you lived a good life, it was going to lead to God's blessing. And though the New Testament does make it clear that suffering is not always the direct result of a person's sin, the cross being the prime example of that, there is definitely some reality to this idea. Sin and sickness can be linked. They are not always linked, but they can be. That said, the disciples' question is probably far more innocent than that. They're probably just not wanting to accuse God of this evil. And so they're trying to make a scapegoat for God. Which makes Jesus' response both powerful and a bit confusing. Did Jesus just say that this man was born blind so God could get glory? I mean, the, the potential implications of that theology are huge. Did God bring suffering into this man's life to simply bring glory to himself? Now, we don't have time for that question. <laughs> Remember the 41 verses? Uh, for, for an in-depth look at that question, I want to encourage you to come back tonight. Uh, Josh Binstead towards 6 p.m. Josh, Josh Binstead, he's a pastor at Rehope in Belfast. He's actually going to come back tonight and he's going to speak a little bit more specifically on this question and what's going on in this text. But so that we can move on and, and kind of get where he's pointing at, let me just say this. The focus of Jesus' response is to show the heart of God, not to explain how the brokenness happened in the first place. You guys catch that? It's, it's actually to point at God's heart. We see this emphasis all over the place. As long, Jesus said, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. And while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Those are his words. And those are echoing all these ideas back from John 6. And then he does this thing where he connects, John connects the ideas that Jesus is teaching with this phrase after saying this, pointing at the reality that he's about to show exactly what he means. He's illustrating his purpose and his power by healing this man who was born blind. The end game of this man's blindness was the manifestation of the work of God, God's visible glory. Jesus is showing that even evil can ultimately contribute to the greater glory of God. The Father has sent his champion, to bring light into the darkness. That is the point. Now, let's be honest. This healing is a little bit bizarre. I mean, just visualize it. The son of God hawks a loogie and creates a saliva mud ball, which he then puts on the guy's face. Can I get a gross, right? That's, that's gross, right? I mean, this is like the ultimate like spiritual facial, right? Now, I'm sure Jesus' saliva is a little cleaner than the rest of ours, but still, that's gross. It's the ultimate mom and dad moment where you lick the shirt and you clean off the face. It's like, it's saliva. Like we're putting saliva on the, whatever. Anyways, the reality is that this whole situation is uncomfortable. It's a little bit, it's a little bit gross. And when I looked at the, trying to, scholars were trying to figure out what it is that's going on here, they were like, we're not sure. I did like what this one guy wrote, though. I found it really fascinating. Uh, it's a really amazing thing to think about. Could this possibly be a moment of recreation, echoing back to God's original creative work of reaching down into the dirt and forming a man and breathing life into him. Is this literally the God of creation forming from the dirt, the stuff that we are made of, new eyes to give to this man? It's an amazing idea to think about. But the miracle doesn't happen in that moment, does it? No, he, there's actually another part to it that involves obedience. So he says, go wash in the pool which is really reminiscent of a story of Elijah's healing with Naaman. You guys remember that story, right? The Old Testament, uh, an Aramean kind of like general guy. He's got leprosy and he comes and he comes to Elijah to get healed. Elijah says, hey, go dip yourself in the Jordan seven times. And he's like, 
What? There was lots of better rivers in my place where I came from. And his servant says, like, if he'd asked you to do something hard, wouldn't you have done it? Now he's asking you to do something simple, just do it. And what happens? Naaman goes and he dips himself in the Jordan seven times and he comes out healed and a believer in the living God. It's an amazing story. And Jesus could have healed this man in the moment without this going. But instead, he asks this man who had lived his entire life as an outsider, a reject, a man set aside to find his way from where he was all the way to the pool to wash. And then he would be healed. And this would require faith. It would require humility. It would require dependence. And more than all of that, it would require obedience. Now, Blindness was a common problem in this era, in, 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 the te- in this New Testament. And it was partially because of, actually, because of unclean water. But we see all throughout the text of the scriptures, this repeated drawing back to the fact that when Messiah comes, Messiah would return sight to the blind. So people are looking for this. There's blindness all around, and they're looking for one that will come back and bring healing in his wings. Jesus is the light of the world, giving sight to those living in darkness, and anyone who wants to walk in the light must come to him. They must follow him. They must obey him. It has to be an act of faith-filled obedience. And in fact, John makes a point of this. He's drawing attention. He says, literally, Siloam means sent. You Think about what he's saying. The one sent by God sent the man to the pool named Sent to receive light. John's just like having a heyday right now. And this, this would have been a dramatic healing. I mean, a man born blind, congenital blindness, it would have created a huge stir. This was the kind of miracle that could be confirmed and literally transform an entire community because they knew what that man was. Remember, you guys think about these situations. We have them happen around here uh, where a person will go in for a scan, the horrible news that there's some sort of cancer in a portion of their body. Several weeks later, they go back in for that same scan after being prayed for, and it's gone, right? It's confirmable. What What do you call that? A miracle, This would have been confirmable and the neighbors and everybody would have gotten involved because they would have seen like, we know who this guy is. Is this really the same man? Was he really born blind? But more importantly, who healed him? Now, before we move on to the rest of this text, I I want us to imagine this scene together a little bit. Imagine the scene from the blind man's perspective. Imagine never having seen anything before. Imagine only knowing darkness. Imagine growing up as the boy who was a disappointment for his family, being unable to work. Imagine being rejected by those around you. Imagine having to beg for food or money. Imagine every day fear of being bumped into suddenly because you're unaware, being taken advantage of, being made fun of, rejected, mocked. Imagine living in a universe which can only be described to you. And then imagine hearing the name Jesus, feeling the slimy mud on your face, Stumbling to the pool, hearing the mocking voices, tripping over uneven surfaces, smelling the wet of the pool before you even get there, stepping down to the edge of the pool, bending down to the water and desperately dipping your face in and washing in darkness. And then all of a sudden, light, color, Faces, distances, ground, sky, an explosion of senses, an explosion of colors, an explosion of movement. Brown dirt, green plants, blue sky, blue water, and your own face looking back at you from the pool. 
a face you've never seen. Imagine it. It's impossible to contemplate what this man must have been going through in this moment. His heart had to have been thrown wide open. The only thing he knew, the only word that resonated in his brain was the word Jesus. What must that have been like? What must he have been thinking? Well, I can tell you one thing he probably wasn't thinking about. The four interrogations that were about to happen. So let's read those, starting in verse 8. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. Well, how then are your eyes open, they asked. And he replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed and then I could see. Well, where is this man, they asked. I don't know, he said. Interrogation number one. First, they, they lean into this man with disbelief and work to verify this miracle. What's interesting, though, is that they don't just reject the miracle, right? They don't just reject it flat out. They, they lean in. They're simply flabbergasted by the healing of a man that they had gotten used to seeing in one way. He was the blind man, the reject, the beggar. This was the identity that they had given to him, and it, that identity didn't make sense anymore. There was a disruption. And all the man could do is tell them what he knew. There was a man named Jesus. He made some mud. He put it on my eyes. I washed, and now I can see. So the neighbors, they do what they need to do. They, they look to the religious elite to help them answer their questions. But there are some interesting implications for these questions, isn't there? Like, like, what does it say to us as we pass by, as we are those people that pass by those that are on the margins of society? He looks like the guy, uh, but I, I don't really remember. Why? Because I have no relationship with him. It looks like the outcast, but, but I don't, I'm not really sure because I don't really know him. The two things that leap out is that there is a lack of real relationship, but also, but also there is a power, there is power in light to disrupt. A huge disruption. And light has a way of shaking things up. Let's keep reading. Verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. Interrogation number two. And John is quick to point out that once again, Jesus is healed on the Sabbath, which makes this next conversation both a religious one and an angry one. The Pharisees interrogate this man with this religious zeal, and they quickly jump to conclusions on the basis of this quote-unquote Sabbath violation because Jesus had made mud and healed on a Sabbath day. And, but they're divided. I mean, some of them conclude that, like, who does good stuff like this if he's not from God? And others are like, there's no way he's a Sabbath violator. There's no way that he's from God. And what in an interesting thing happens is, is you have this man born blind who has been rejected and set aside. He's an outsider, and he's stuck between these two religious elite, and they're forcing him to make decisions. But all he can do is say the facts. Uh, the man called Jesus put mud on my eyes, and now I can see but that's not good enough for the Pharisees. They want him to take a side. Is Jesus from God or not? Man, isn't that a potent question for our day and age? Is Jesus from God or not? They force this poor man to pick, and by calling him a prophet, 
a.k.a. somebody sent by God, he chooses Jesus. And that doesn't go over well. And so what's the Pharisee's response? That's it. We're talking to your parents. <laughs> See, I'm a parent. That makes sense to me. I was like, oh, I know how that goes. Here we go. Next verse, verse 18. They still did not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it now that he can see? Well, we know he is our son, the parents answered, and, and we know he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That's why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. Interrogation number three. The Pharisees are trying to find a simple answer to their dilemma. This man has got to be a fraud. So they interrogate the parents in front of him. They need to confirm this miracle's authenticity, but now the true nature of their anger, the true nature of their power begins to come out because we see fear in the parents' eyes. They are, with a little bit of courage, willing to go halfway. Yeah, this is our son, and yeah, we know that he was born blind, but they are not willing to go as far as picking sides like their son did. Being put out of the synagogue was way too big of a risk, so they deflect it back to the man. Ask him. He's of age. Now, what I, what I find absolutely crazy about this situation is the reality of this man's circumstances. We don't know his age. We don't know how long he had been on the street or out of his parents' home, but there's one thing that we definitely know. He had never seen his parents' face he had never looked into his mom's eyes. He didn't know the color of his father's hair. And what should have been a moment of rejoicing was instead a moment of religious fear and anxiety for his parents. And I think that that's kind of what explains what happens next and how and why he responds the way he does in this next verses. Verse 24. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know. I was blind, but now I see. Did you catch that? I was blind, but now I see. Then they ask him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? They don't care. He answered, I've told you already and you do not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? <laughs> you can hear it in there, can't you? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Interrogation number four. Pharisees interrogate the man a second time in frustration, challenging him to tell the truth. We know he's a sinner. But the man refuses to comment on Jesus' sinfulness and once again simply authenticates the miracle, which causes the tension to rise again. So the man asks, either in innocence or sarcasm, I lean towards the sarcasm, uh, if their desire to hear the story again is out of their secret desire to become his disciples. His boldness comes from common sense. Common sense. 
What he finds amazing isn't his own belief. It's the fact that they don't believe. The miracle demands an explanation. Its sheer magnitude points to only one source, God. And this is where the man gets super rational and very clear saying, first, God does not listen to sinners. And second, no one opens the eyes of men born blind. So this man must be from God. Whether it was his tone or just the sheer conviction of both sides, this causes the Pharisees to explode. You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. And the Pharisees revert to mocking because of their arrogance, pride, and rage. We've all seen this before, haven't we? I mean, like nobody in this room, just like the noon gathering maybe. <laughs> Backed into a corner, you're, you're, you, you've got stuff on the line and suddenly you lose it. It's no longer about the thing. It's just name calling and anger. They can't see their own brokenness. They're so filled with rage. So they lash out because they're spiritually blind. And the result is that the man is expelled from the synagogue, which leads us to this final chunk of scripture. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. And we're left with another Jesus mic drop. <laughs> the story closes in this place of Jesus reaching out and finding this now rejected again man who used to be blind, which leads to this powerful confession of faith. Lord, I believe. And, and immediately upon that confession, he falls to his knees and he worships, showing that he is no longer in darkness, but now is in the light. He's committing himself to this Messiah, to this son of man, as he moves from this kind of like respectful sir in verse 36 through to Lord in verse 38. He is kneeling before God. And Jesus welcomes him into his new family. We get, we the reader, we get this, this front row seat to watch the blind man progress from calling Jesus a prophet in verse 17 to defending him against the Pharisees' charges in verse 25 and inviting them to become his disciples in verse 27 to correcting their doctrine in verse 34 to finally confessing Jesus as Lord and worshiping him in verse 38. It's an amazing, amazing conversion experience. Each scene pointing at Jesus, the revelation of a God, all the while, at the exact same time, the Pharisees, in a display of John's kind of poetic irony, are oblivious to their own blindness. Thus, their guilt remains. While this man walks home free, sight restored, spiritually transformed, and now a believer and worshiper of Jesus. This story is about so much more than just a miracle. It represents a highly symbolic display of Jesus' ability to cure spiritual blindness. And as the religious elite balk and mock, Jesus throws it right back in their face and he says, the only sin for which there is no cure is the spiritual pride that claims to see while living in blindness. This is so important to catch. The only sin for which there is no cure is the spiritual pride that claims to see while living in blindness. May it never be. The Pharisees come forward to judge this man and Jesus. 
And ultimately, they are the ones that get judged by Jesus. The accusers stand accused. And the story of chapter 9 plays out this full announcement that we heard in chapter 8. Jesus is the light of the world. In light, it's triumphed over darkness. And especially in the life of this one man who was born blind, in his eyes, in his heart, in his whole life. But in this moment, light also becomes a symbol of judgment. As John wrote earlier in John 3, verse 19 through 21, light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. John 3, verses 19 through 21. The once blind man had never seen Jesus and eagerly asks, who is the son of man? Who is this Messiah that I might believe in them? You can hear the eagerness. He acknowledges his blindness and he, and he confesses out loud a longing for more light. So he gets it. Jesus gives it to him. He asks, he says, I'm needy, Lord. I need your light. And so what does Jesus do? He gives it to him. That's what he does. The Pharisees, on the other hand, who claim to see, end up condemning themselves in their rejection of Jesus. The gulf that sets the Pharisees and this blind man apart is this gulf of pride. Pride versus humility. Arrogance versus open-handed need. And John shows us that it is a willingness to admit weakness and confess our own spiritual blindness that acts as the key to open salvation's lock. Our willingness to be weak. Who is he? The man asks for clarity so that, so that he can obey. And his response is immediate. Lord, I believe. I believe. As the band comes up, I, I want to talk about a few tensions that I feel in this text as a reader. Things that I carry personally, and maybe, maybe you do too. I, I feel this tension between seeing this blind, religious, but not blind group of people, and this non-religious, non-seeing yet seeing group of people. There's a tension there. The people that should have known better didn't. And the people who should, didn't know anything did. There's, I feel a tension in that. I, I feel the tension in my own personal blind spots. Those times where I'm held back by rules or by fear or by my own pride. My own blind spots that get in the way of me really being able to see. I feel that tension. And then there's this other tension of knowledge where like literally those with the most information knew the least and those with the least amount of information knew the most. Man, I feel the tension in that. But mostly, mostly I feel the tension of asking this question, who am I in this story? Who am I? Maybe, maybe you join me in this asking this question. Am I the neighbors? I'm just a spectator. Don't mess with my status quo. I kind of like things the way they are. I mean, when light invades, it gets a little complicated. And, and honestly, if, if, if it could kind of just stay the same, and I, and I know that the blind guy's got his part, and uh, the person over here's got his part, and I've got my part, and let's just kind of keep it all that way, all on the good. I think Jesus would step into that, right? Jesus messes with the status quo. That's what Jesus does. He steps in. He doesn't leave things the way they are. He makes things better. In fact, he says, I'm making all things new. He won't leave things as is. And if you don't like that, 
If you want to be a neighbor, I'm just going to say get used to being uncomfortable in Jesus' presence. Or maybe, like me, I find myself in this place sometimes where, I, like maybe I'm the Pharisee in this story. I won't believe. How dare you challenge my beliefs, Jesus? And Jesus is compassionate and he's gracious, but I'm stuck in my own systems, in my own personal lives, arguing about realities that are way beyond my control, caught up in issues I can't even do anything about. Instead of just saying, Jesus, I want to submit to you. I feel like if the blind man was here and or if the blind man could have gotten the Pharisees' attention, he would have just kept saying the same sentence over and over and over again until the Pharisees woke up. I was blind and now I see. I lived in darkness, but now I'm in light. So you go have your arguments over there, but I'm gonna take the changed life. I think that's what the blind, blind man would say to the Pharisees. Or maybe, or maybe we're the, we're the parents. And this is dangerous in this room, right? On Sunday morning, willing to go halfway. Yeah, Jesus, I'm, I'm willing to come on a Sunday and maybe even do something in the middle of the week. I'm willing to give you a little bit of me as long as it doesn't cost me. To that, I... I'm pretty sure I know what Jesus would say. There is no partial allegiance to Jesus. Now he's gracious and he walks with us through our journey, but Jesus, he doesn't do halfway. He doesn't do only a bit. He demands that you step out and that's what he demanded of the blind man, which if I'm going to be honest, is the man that I want to be in this story. I want to be that guy. I want to be the man that says any time, any cost, I will follow you, Jesus. And we're all in this journey together. We're all moving through this reality together. And I think if the blind man was here, he would simply stand up and say, you can't come part way. If you want healing, you've got to go all the way to the pool. If you want light, then you have to stand up and be counted. Church, the world already has way too many halfway Christians. Church, Jesus isn't asking for us to only go a part of the way, to walk around with the mud on our face. No, he's asking us to go to the water and to wash and be healed and to receive light and life and to go home changed. He's asking us to stand. Which is what I'm going to do this morning. There's a bunch of you out there and you've already done this. Like you're, you're this person. You already live a life that's all in and you've given it to him. And you said, Jesus, it's all yours. I surrender it to you. And there's another group of you who you're like, man, I, I, I'm on this journey. I'm not there yet. And you know what? He's got so much grace and so much patience and he is with you in that process. But there is another group that are in this room at this 10 o'clock gathering and you know who you are. And Jesus is saying, it's time. It's time to stand and be counted. It's time to get kicked out of the synagogue. It's time to be the man or the woman that God has called you to be all in more than just Sunday, more than just part way, more than just religion, all of Jesus. So I'm gonna ask you to stand right now. If you're out there, stand.